recording. So last time we heard something about the theory between we had the Stokes parameters and we saw what are some very basic uh, elements that we use to measure Stokes parameters and we basically got the idea what modulation is. And today we have episode director, Valentin martinez Pie, who is going to tell us a little bit about what people actually do, right? So, yeah, so without I, further ado... I don't do anything. <laughs> 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 You're used to, at least. Uh, yeah, um, okay. Uh, so, I am going to be talking about uh, spectropolarimetry and instrumentally related aspects of the spectropolarimetry. What uh, Ivan told me is to say something at the end of what is the difference between doing relative polarimetry versus absolute polarimetry. Uh, so for the first part, which is how you do polarimetry from an instrumental point of view, I have here 90 slides that I give in a course that takes three to four hours. I'm gonna give that in 30 minutes, oh okay? Uh, and I'm gonna uh, leave the remaining 30 minutes to discuss about absolute versus relative polarimetry. So I'm gonna go quick because I think in some cases you know most of it. So it has three parts, my, 30 min my first 30 minutes, and I think you gave the second part of what I, uh, what I typically do in five hours. Yes, the second part is what you explained the Stokes parameters. So you heard something about the definition of the Stokes. But I think I want to go through all of it because I'm going to give you the entire presentation and you can have it and you can go through it when you have some, nothing better to do. Uh, and, and go through it if you think you like to know better. So, yeah, these are the three parts. I think you more or less touched on this. I'm going to concentrate more on modern spectropolarimeters. So, this is really, this is almost something that probably uh, you've gone through optics, basic optics courses, there is people here in the audience that should know more than me, know more than me, uh, and I'm very happy to know that. I, actually, many people here know more than me about many of these things. Uh, this is your, we just bring this kind of, but I have notations, and then I'll go into this. One thing that I want to say about polarimetry is that, uh, um, actually, not this part here. I mean, really, it's all about science and making errors with science. Uh, polarimetry is really a pain in terms of how often you can make errors with science. And, and you know, I have these quotes in here. You really need to go first to your books and see what are the signs that you are using for two things that are important. One is this refractive index, whether they use a plus or a minus here, it changes everything. Or whether you are doing the uh, plane wave, the K, R, minus, omega, T, or the other criteria. It changes a lot. So make sure you don't mix it. As they say here, there are even books that change the criteria from chapter to chapter, probably without knowing the author that this changes. And I know at least one book that does that. So it's this back, how polarimetry can be. And then there's this quote from Bruce Lights that says, if you want to make sure you have formulas that never have an error with the signs, go to a GDO's landing in the book because they never have an error. Okay. And I think that's absolutely true. Okay. Nobody has found error in his books or papers uh, problem with the signs. The rest of the literature is absolutely filled with problems with error. So I have some uh, things here. Start with Maxwell equations. Now I'm going to go really fast, but I think you know most of it. Uh, about how you how you propagate waves in media. Okay, so what all I'm doing, the only important thing is again this one. Make sure this this one that they are being used and not the other one, the uh, if you put the plus here, okay? Because then all changes, all all, all criteria changes, or even if you keep this one, whether there is in the faces a minus, not a plus. Okay. These signs are key. Because if you're gonna get totally crazy, you know. Uh, if you're not careful with this with this criteria, and this is the ones I'm using here. I, for what I saw yesterday, you're using the same. I'm using the same. Yeah. Um, uh, but Atham and Basra uses a different one actually. So it really depends on the book. Uh, these are plane waves. Uh, the electric media, the electric are lenses. The electric are glasses. So you would propagate waves, and you need to know what happens to the electric fields when you propagate them. And this is. Uh, you probably have seen this in your uh, regular undergrad courses. 
I put it here in a way that you can then apply to almost to all Mueller matrices that I'll show in a second. So I'm trying to do this, which is known by many people, by all of you have seen it, uh, so that I can apply it for a generic Mueller matrix that I'll show you in a second. I have total reflection, uh, conducting media. Why is conducting media important? Mirrors. Mirrors are conducting media. I want to know uh, the polarization changes when we see the mirror. <laughs> equations. But I'm gonna skip all of this. But I'm keeping this, you are gonna see this symbol and this symbol alone. P is the ratio between the amplitudes when you hit a media, and delta is the phase difference. Okay. And I'm going through all the cases. And isotropic media, why are they important? Because each polarization sees a different refractive index. So it's really all about polarization when you are dealing with an isotropic media. Uh, so we use them a lot in polarimetry. Again, uh, I'm going to go rather quick. This is Polaroids, an isotropic conducting media. And this is your part two. Here I'm coming up with the definition of the Stokes parameters, uh, which you gave <laughs> yesterday, in relation to a plane wave. Uh, with, you probably saw this equation yesterday. I think, I think you have them, right? And the signs were the same. Uh, and perhaps this is something that I want to uh, spend some more time, which is the operational definition of the Stokes parameters. Because you can define this for a plane wave, but that is only valid for a plane wave. This one is valid for any beam of light. Take a linear polarizer, take a retarder, uh, put a linear polarizer at an angle, and make the Y axis, I should be touching this, I think. <laughs> uh, in the y axis has a phase difference of epsilon. Then you can come up with that's what's going to happen to your electric field, and then you make the time average, and then you make six measurements. And the six measurements have the linear polarizer at these angles. And here you are not introducing any phase difference, and here you are introducing a phase difference of 90 degrees. Then you do S1, S2, S3. So again, Whatever light you are have, take a linear polarizer and take a retarder, do these six measurements, you can define IQ, U, and B from your measurements. So it's an operational definition because it's from something you can measure. It doesn't depend whether you have a plane wave or whatever way. You just do this and you get IQ, U, and B. Operational definition. Okay? And I'm going to use it in a second. Uh, Rotation of a Mueller matrix, what happens? So I have all of this here. I have the P and the phase. I've given the P and the phase for all of the processes in media. So you can go put the numbers there and you get the Mueller matrix for almost anything. You can think of, you can have an optics, that's what I'm doing here. This is the genetic Mueller matrix for whatever P and whatever delta. And I have the anisotropic media, the isotropic media, the metallic uh, formulas for P and delta. You put it there, you get the Mueller matrix. And then you do rotations. So these are all the cases I'm not going to spend. I mean, most of them you've seen it. Uh, here I'm trying to come up with the formulas uh, that give you, uh, with the sign criteria that I have, all of these Mueller matrices. Perhaps this is important because we'll discuss this a little later, which is the Mueller matrix of a telescope. Uh, and here, what you have is the Mueller matrix of Dickies at the secondary focus, not a prime focus after the two off axis reflection. And I completed this with the theory in this, uh, that you have here in these presentations. Uh, this is for 4,300 uh, and uh, 15,000. So you see the Mueller matrix gets better, 0.178 is the Mueller matrix and secondary focus gets smaller, and it gets smaller as you go to the infrared. We so didn't go so much in depth about Mueller matrices, I just said what they do. So maybe you can explain to okay. people why it's so important to have them almost diagonal, right? Uh, right, so the Mueller matrix is you have the solar stokes vector and you measure something. And if what it is in between is not diagonal, it's mixing your polarization. That's what is called instrumental polarization. And you need to correct for instrumental polarization before you get the solar value, because you get the ones at the secondary focus in case of this Mueller matrix. 
for dickies, then it goes down. Well, we have calibration of ticks here. And once you have calibration of ticks, you know that what you do after that, you are going to be able to calibrate it from your calibration of ticks. Uh, we don't have calibration of ticks before the prime corpus, so that's why I was just give this as an example. But we can calibrate that too. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. But everybody knows what a Mueller matrix is, right? So it's, what, it's a matrix that describes how the those parameters change through your optical system. Wait, so is that the Mueller matrix from the Gauss to from, the no, K from, or from, no, the from the sun from the sun to the secondary to focus? Okay. To the, so it's only this uh, of axis reflection and this of axis reflection on the secondary focus. To the Gauss box. To the Gauss, yeah. So you're using the biggest language, of course. Uh, which, so it's from the sun to the gods. Gods is here, and in the gods, secondary focus is where we have this calibration of this. Okay, that's just one example. I describe here what is the Mueller matrix at, prime, uh, at the focus of a lens or of a mirror. What is the Mueller matrix here? Uh, what is the Mueller matrix here? It's the entity. Why? Because it is uh, symmetry. It's rotational symmetry. But, but I, demonstrate all of these images. Uh, and then you can understand that this proposal for a telescope was a really bad idea. Someone, and I'm not going to say who, proposed a huge solar telescope. This is four meters, and this one is two meters. One of these. A huge solar telescope that had this uh, configuration of uh, seven, uh, seven mirrors, right? Uh, this is a linear polarizer in this direction. So, well, I mean, you can, if you calibrate it, it's fine, but as a linear polarizer in this direction, it's a huge linear polarizer. Uh, and you can compute the Mueller matrix using these equations here. Well, it's good because then you will only need the retardant to have right. polar image. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you, you got, so here you have the Mueller matrix of acid rains, today, we call it, and all kinds of focuses, depending on, uh, you just have to follow the 90. Slides and I just went really quick. So I, I want to start a little, I'm going to go more slowly here uh, with modern uh, spectropolarimeters. How do we do polarimetry? Well, the first important thing is that all of our detectors only measure intensity, energy of the light. We don't have detectors that measure polarization. Not, I mean, there are some detectors that do are sensitive. Uh, to polarization, uh, but actually they are not good for anything, for most, so we can forget it. All of our silicon-based detectors or CCDs infrared detectors, they are not sensitive uh, to polarization. So what we need to measure is intensities, and what we need to encode is the information on polarization into intensities. And what we do is, for example, what I just said, this operational definition of the Stokes parameters, where with a retarder or with a linear polarizer, you can do six basic measurements and get all the Stokes parameters. Uh, it was the definition, but actually you can demonstrate that it, it agrees with your definition of, for, for, for a plane wave, which is this idea of having the polarizer in four orientation, the one I just explained. And then you add a retarder with 90 degrees um, and you put the polarizer into other orientation, make the six intensities, and we know how to measure intensity. We don't know how to measure polarization, but we know how to measure intensity. You do this combination, and you get the Stokes parameters of your life. Okay? Now, is this the best we can do? Uh, the answer is no, we can do much better. Why? Why is this a problem? Well, first, you want to measure four parameters, but you still do six measurements. It doesn't seem to be the most practical way of doing it. Uh, so people do it, and you see who, uh, but it's, I mean, for four, you probably need only four. Uh, it, it's also, uh, it has also one problem, which is when you are, for measuring Q, Q, you really measure Q only when you are doing S1 and S3, but really not S2. For S2, doesn't, you don't use S2 for Q. Uh, so that means that if, for example, what is what we're doing here? What we call temporal modulation. We are measuring different things at different times to measure the Stokes parameters, right? We're measuring six consecutive times. If things change, it's probably a bad idea because maybe you have different Stokes parameters. You want everything to be stable on the sun, on the star, on whatever astronomical uh, 
object you are studying or in your system. You don't want anything to change. You just don't want to measure things that have changed or you don't want to measure your system. You want to have everything stay the same and then you do all these six measurements and you load this, those parameters of that bill, right? What we're doing is temporal modulation. So uh, measuring Q only in S1 and S3, uh, but not in S2, only if everything is stable in time, makes sense. If things change, maybe this Q and this you are not compatible. And you'll see this more clearly later. Uh, the retarder is only used in the last two measurements. The first uh, S1, S2, S3, S4, don't use it. Then S5 and S6, there is a zero here, use the retarder. And there are other practical things like you have to rotate things, and that might, uh, but that's really not that important. I mean, that's one way of measuring the stoss parameters. But can we do better? Uh, I go here through demonstrating these equations with the Mueller matrices that I derived in the first part of my presentation. So these are the Mueller matrices of a linear polarizer at uh, 0, uh, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, and 140. Uh, degrees here. And these are for the retarder. And then what I do is the following. Okay, these are the ones we're using for S1, S2, S3, S4, and S6. Okay. Um, but we only measure intensity. So you have I, Q, Q, and B. You only measure intensity. All you really care is about the first row of the Mueller matrix. So let's grab this first row, this first row, this one, this one. This one, this one, and put them in a matrix. And you put I, Q, U, and B, and your six measurements. This is the same as before. So I'm just grabbing this first row. These are the only things that we know how to measure, the first row. We don't know how to measure the others. The others impact the polarization of your the output line, but not the intensity. Put this here, and what is what this is called? This is called the modulation matrix. So these are the Stokes parameters, and these are your measurements. What, what from this, those parameter gives you the, uh, your, your measurements is the modulation matrix. What are we calling this modulation matrix, which really depends on how you measure the source parameter. So I think this is kind of clear what I'm doing. This is not a Mueller matrix, okay? This has first rows of Mueller matrices, but it's not a Mueller matrix. In, and, and this is not a Stokes vector. This is a Stokes vector, but this is not. But it's also matrix for models. Uh, yeah, that's what I say here. Uh, that the, uh, we call it modulation matrix, and I'm going to call it X. Another text that describes this is O. Um, and it's always of this type is one, 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 and something. Why one? Because these Mueller matrices always here have ones. Uh, is this always the case? Well, that's actually the transmission. If your transmission is really changing when you are moving your quarter wave place and all of that, that's not one. So in the practical life, these numbers are close to one, but they are not really one. Okay. And the other thing is that this mirror, this matrix, the modulation matrix X is n times four. Of course, four because there are four those parameters. N is the number of measurements that you are doing. In the previous case, it's six, but it can be whatever. And you can you see other cases. Um, so yeah, then the, ideally, uh, that's what gives you the Stokes parameters to your measurements. The measurements is what you have. You want the Stokes parameters, so you need the inverse. Uh, and the inverse is called the demodulation matrix because the other one is the modulation, so this one is demodulation. I think almost everybody calls in the solar in the solar physics uh, world, we call it all modulation, demodulation. Do you know of anyone using different terms? I have heard even here within NSO other terms for other things, but here is always modulation and demodulation. Okay, the demodulation uh, matrix, here I call it D, uh, thing is M is four for measurements, then it's just the inverse, because it's four by four, you know how to invert that. Uh, and it gives you, once you have your measurements, it gives you the stuff parameters on the side. But as you saw, sometimes it's not four. And then what do you do? Um, well, do you actually compute something that is called the moore penrose pseudo inverse, which is this guy. Does everybody know what the moore penrose pseudo inverse is? Well, it's actually very 
it's used all over the place for so many things. And that the fact that this idea of polarization actually ended up with the world kernels, soothing birds, tells you there's nothing new ever. <laughs> it was invented already. So you can actually put this in book in Wikipedia, but it's a full web page on the world kernels wiki. Uh, so the first uh, Wikipedia. So what you have, your x is the modulation. Take the modulation, take the transfer, multiply by x, do the inverse. This is a square matrix, you can always do the inverse. And multiply by the transfer of x, you get something that is called d. And that's the best demodulation matrix that you can use for any uh, following method that will maximize your sensitivity to the stones parameters. Um, if it sounds magic, what you're trying to do is make sure that the signal to noise is the maximum of your data. So you're maximizing something, or it's like the least square. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. It is a least square. So either you minimize or you maximize, depending on what you, but you are doing the least square. Um, and that's what this zoom inverse metric is. It's, a least square. it's the best matrix in the least square sense, is the inverse. Yeah. But I'm confused now. Why does it guarantee the optimal efficiency? Doesn't efficiency actually depend on the choice of these angles? Yeah, yeah, it does. But then it goes into what your demodulation. Yeah, but this should, should be the, the only solution. I mean, these should be the, the, as you said, the least square solutions to this. So let me. Okay, uh, I've been too fast, uh, but I'm so let's stop here. You have many options. Once is a metric that is four times n, and n is not four, you don't have a single. Demodulation map. You have many inverses uh, that can give you uh, the, the uh, multiplying by the original matrix identity. Okay, yeah. uh, it's not it's not uh, a single <coughs> inverse. You have many. Uh, for example, well, I had one example before. I don't want to enter into that. But you don't have a unique uh, inverse. Okay, so. Of all of those, you want to select the one that is, in this case, maximizes your signal to noise. And that's how it was defined originally. So what you do is, that's the measurements to the uh, Stokes parameters. Here, I'm calling already the Stokes parameters I1, I2, I3, and I4. Uh, and this is the elements of the demodulation matrix. Uh, do error propagation here. Uh, you do error propagation, you get this formula, that's error propagation. And what is the derivative of i with respect to the s's? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it's the d's. You put them there. Put them there. Uh, this is the and this is the error of one s. This is the error of the noise in your measurements. Typically, if it is a system, it's photon noise. That was whatever photon noise gives you. And typically, it's the same for all the Stokes parameters. Not always, uh, but I'm going to assume it's the same. I'm going to take this out of the uh, sum signing here. I'm saying all the all the measurements, not all the Stokes, all the measurements have the same type of that type of photon noise, and I take it out. Then, uh, when you do, if you measure one thing, you have an error signal. If you repeat this n times and add. And the errors are non-correlated. The sigma goes down by the square root of n, right? That's the, the uh, big number theorem, uh, right? So this is Gaussian statistics. So we know there is a benefit from doing many measurements. And if you are doing s plus n measurements, you are doing n measurements. So there should be a benefit the square root of n. And I'm going to just put it here that there should be a benefit of the square root of n. I bring it here. Then this quantity here is the polarimetric efficiencies. That's what we define as polarimetric efficiency. And if you want to have them, um, they're here. Um, they actually have these properties uh, that, if, for example, they are all the same for Q, U, and B. I'm going really fast, and I know that. I, mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I need more time to really go into the details of all of this. Uh, actually, if they are the same and they are as high as they can be, they can be larger than 0.577, and they are all the same. Okay. Uh, you can, if you just follow the equations and you uh, do the math, you get these uh, properties. Uh, what you are doing is actually uh, selecting from all the, if they are maximum, you are selecting from all the potential demodulation matrices, the one that gives you the highest signal to us. 
I can, the reference that explains this in detail is this one from uh, Jose Carlos Amorosis and Oxford. So it's all described there. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. don't call it actually more perros. I don't think they knew it's the more perros inverse. Okay, it's not called there, but I, I call it in there. But then, uh, uh, yes, in this one you you know about it, and it's defined here. What you are doing is in this <laughs> way of defining the polarimetric efficiencies, um, <coughs> we're only assuming there are errors due to the measurements. In your article, you were also assuming errors on the these, I think. Yes. That's what you were propagating, also errors on the, on the, on the, on the measure, on the measure, measure. measure. Yes. Yeah. No, my question just came because I always thought that the efficiency is going to depend on your choice of the modulation but matrix. And then we basically settled that we're always going to demodulate using this more Penrose inverse. So, the, uh, well, yeah, but then you are doing the maximum. You are getting the maximum efficiency since you're doing the... Yes, but I mean, if I choose angles very poorly, it can end up that I'm, for example, measuring Stokes V very badly, right? Yes, uh, meaning that you are actually maximizing for your poor, for your poor uh, choice, you are maximizing the signal to know. Okay. But you could do better. Okay. 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 But you still could do better. Okay. So, yes, that's the D. I'll show some examples that actually give you what this should be. But yes, if you do choose poor angles, you will, by selecting the more pair of universe, that's the one that gives you the best signal okay. yeah. But it's not that you cannot do better. Okay. So these are the concept of polarimetric efficiencies. It's really what we use is when we are going to define a polarimeter. We want to make them actually as close as possible to 0.577, all three of them. Okay. And then there is no way of doing much better than this. Okay. I mean, whether the question is whether you want to maximize or optimize it. And, uh, you, I have both words up here, so that means uh, you're trying to do everything. So, I, <laughs> anyway. so examples. Uh, this is the one we just saw, the sixth measurement, the, 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 the original one, the operational definition of the source parameters. Uh, this is the modulation matrix. This is actually a website where you put your uh, Matrix and it gives you the whole pair of pseudoinverse. That's how well known they are. I mean, we go to this website and it gives you the whole pair of pseudoinverse. So they are really, really well known for and used for many other things. Because this is a square type of thing. Uh, and here is maximizing efficiency, what you are doing with this square. So I didn't do the whole pair of pseudoinverse. I went to the website to do that. Yeah. Um, and I know it's right, right? So because demodulation matrices always have one property. I, I, it's kind of obvious. You have this all adds to one, and the others all add to zero. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, why? Well, because if light is unpolarized, you are one, zero, 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 zero. All the intensities are the same, right? All the intensities should not modulate in time because there's no polarization. If all intensities are the same, what you multiply by here should give you one and then zero, zero, zero. That's why these modulation matrices have these properties. If you don't, you made a mistake. But here you'll always see that they add to zero, to zero, to zero, and you want to one. So this is in this case the demodulation matrix that guarantees you are getting the maximum signal to noise if you use this one. Okay. You could do better. Uh, with this six is hard, but uh, in all that, because there's not that many choices. Yeah, you could have selected different angles for the quarter wave plate, and then your deficiencies will be lower. Okay, and by doing the move pen rows, you will still be using, in that case, the demodulation matrix that gives you this signal to but you're not doing that well. Here in this case, actually, the demodulation, the deficiencies are as high as it gets. Okay, so the problem of this example. This is doing I plus Q, I minus Q, I plus U, I minus U, I plus V, I minus V. It gives you the highest efficiency. But what's the problem? Uh, well, it's not very efficient. This is the same case that I was explaining before, which is uh, Iris does that. Uh, so it gets the highest efficiency. But it's doing six measurements for four parameters. Um, it doesn't have rotating elements. I think it's liquid crystals, right? What Iris uses. But that's what they are producing with 
of the liquid crystals, hopefully, right? If they get the right voltages for the right phases, they get a one here or not, all this, this is what we were talking about, yes, you can do worse than this. So if they get a one, then they're doing as well as they can. And, uh, and there are zeros in the D. So sometimes you're doing measurements that do not have an impact on I, Q, U, and V. So this one is only impacting V. And not Q and U. This is what I was saying, that not you are doing measurements and you are not always measuring all the stones parameters. You are measuring sometimes this, sometimes Q, sometimes U. If something changes, for example, on the sun, then your Q, U, and this might not be fully compatible. Uh, that's good, but might not be the best. I particularly don't think it's the best. But he was the one that implemented this in IB, so go ahead. That was a four state modulation. No one was brave enough to use it. Um, <laughs> my oh, no, no, well, okay, oh, you mean in IBIS? In IBIS. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, with four state. With, well, with four liquid, with two liquid crystals, well, you'll see it in a second, I'll get to that. I mean, of course, yeah, that's what you should have done. When, when it's easy to find for liquid crystals these, these phases, but to get the six state modulation. Uh, but the other question is, this is all the, the demodulation matrix for your modulator, for the liquid crystal or the... For whatever, for the, if this is the modulation metric, this is the, the modulation metric you should use for making sure you have the highest signal to one. Right. But there's all the other optics before it. Do you have to combine oh, all yeah. of those no. matrices? To yes. Really yes. Get of the no, yeah, of course. Uh, and I'll say something about this. Yes, everything that is changing the polarization, I'm calling this instrumental polarization. I'll say something about it. But yeah, of course, you have to correct. You have to go to the sun, right? That's just. So, what is what I have here? Uh, it's two guys only, right? Or in your case, for I use two liquid crystals. Sure. No more. There is no even a lens. There is nothing before, in the right. middle, or after. This is the idealized yeah. demodulation. Right. And, and actually, whether it is before, in the middle, or after is important. They do have different effects, and they are there. Whatever is before is really important. Whatever is after the linear polarization is never that important. And what is in between is potentially important. And I can explain why if you have an interest. I don't, I don't have any slide about this. Uh, okay, so this is one case. Who is doing this too? Is HMI. HMI does the same. HMI does the I plus B, I plus Q, minus Q, plus minus, plus minus, you are, uh, you are B. Uh, six, it takes six states. Uh, but in this case, it's not liquid crystals, they rotate wave, uh, wave plates. Uh, almost like the definition. Okay, so HMI does the same. Uh, and I don't know why, <laughs> to be frank, I don't know why the people are using it. A very common way of doing polarimetry in solar physics is by taking a retarder, uh, whatever, I'll say something about the retarder, but taking a retarder and rotating it. Uh, this is very common, and you'll see how it works in a second. The only thing that this modulator cannot be is a halfway plate. That would be a bad idea. Do you know why a halfway plate is a bad idea? Because it's only linear. Uh, halfway plane is only a rotation of the of the uh, frame of reference, so it will never produce any circular light uh, modulation. So it can be almost anything, and you see what is the best uh, retardant for this modulator. But it's a bad <coughs> idea if it were a halfway plane. Um, so here you have the what do you want to have here? The polarization modulator, which is this one, and the linear polarizer. Uh, a linear polarizer will be you what I call the plus Q beam. Today, in polarimetry, we do always plus Q and minus Q. We put not a linear polarizer, but a beam splitter that gives you the orthogonal polarization. And that's for reducing seam induced cross talk. I'll show you why this is really important. Uh, but for the time being, it's really not that important. Uh, this is just a beam. Uh, you could have selected the minus beam. Uh, here, I'm using the plus Q. So you take all the linear matrices for a rotating retarder. I mean, you know, it takes some algebra, uh, but you eventually get to this equation. That's what a rotating retarder uh, with a linear polarizer will generate at the end in the George detector. So you, you modulate Q, you modulate Q, and you modulate the stops. Uh, so I'm taking longer with this than I thought. So I'm gonna because I really well, want, I want to, to know this thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, so. Just do the math. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yes. 
So perhaps the only point of let me show you this. Uh, the only thing here is that in this case, uh, you need eight measurements. Uh, you need to take eight measurements. You cannot do less than eight for getting. Why? It's just because of the uh, it's two omega versus the four omega, because they have different phases. Q and U are four omega, uh, but V is two. Meaning that from the modulation, you modulate twice Q and U, while V, which is this one, is modulated on once. And the only way to make with this rotating wave play the full stops is by making eight samples. And you can see which one we're modulating in each one, going through the equations. I mean, there's nothing made in here. Uh, so you want to always have similar amplitudes for Q, for U, and for V. So you take this, this is the term that moving is B. You make it equal to one minus cosine delta over two, which is the same term for you. You'll get the best uh, retardants for the retard. That model is Q, U, and B by the same amount. Happens to be this crazy number. Uh, so you have to go to your optical manufacturer until I don't need that retardance uh, all over the spectrum. If it's achromatic, I don't want 90 degrees, I want that. So it's kind of a, I mean, Many people like it, but and I use it, uh, and it works. It works, so it, you have no problem. And the other one also wants to. Uh, is there any real problem here? No, I said something about this. It's only that you need eight measurements. Okay, you cannot do less than eight measurements. S would be as one as two as three as four as six as seven as eight. So if you need eight measurements, you're, the sun is still going to be changing, right? So. In a way, when you were doing the six measurements and you were measuring Q, U, and V separately in time, it makes more sense that you're actually going to get something meaningful, whereas here you're averaging over the whole measurement. Yes, so, uh, but the best is to do four measurements only. Okay, <laughs> I'll get to that. So this is what the advanced stops polarimeter did. And if you take the, what is X, you can go through the math and put the numbers there, you get that's the modulation matrix. And you go to the website, don't do the inverse, the move Penrose inverse. Website gives you the demodulation metric, which is here. And again, all of this adds to one, all of this adds to zero, zero, and zero. There are as many positive as negative. This is what the demodulation matrix is always look like. Here, the efficiencies have these weird numbers. They are not the maximum. This is one example, one example where you don't get the best uh, because you, know, you did something that is, but it's not that bad, right? I mean, the maximum is 0 0.57, 0 0.57, 0 0.57. Well, yeah, this is okay, it's close enough. But it's really one case in which you're not getting the best uh, that we need to do. Um, but if you are doing this, use this matrix to get the maximum symmetric for demodulating the stop Who is using this? Actually, a lot of people that bought stop polarimeter. That really was the first modern spectral polarimeter. Spinner at the DST, still the bios. They said that he know this is still rotating. That's the know uh, Still there, rotating. It's working. Uh, Three of the biggest instruments use this technique. This is uh, the owners, dry owners, and this all use this technique. Uh, not BTF. BTF, this is the one I'm going to show you next. I like that it has no zeros, and that was why it was proposed originally. You are always measuring all the stokes parameters. So if it changes, it changes for everybody. So you know that Q, Q, and B are going to be more compatible on themselves than when you have zeros. Because B might not be compatible with you. In this case, Changes in time of seeing of your telescope or in the sun impact all measurements uh, in the same way. Uh, crystal retardants are good, they are, they are easy to produce, and you know, it's rotating, so you can have problems with your image doing funny things, you have something rotating in your, uh, in your optical scheme. So this is the ASP. Uh, ASP has it somewhere here, uh, rotating retardant. Uh, the rotating retarder here for Inode. And this is the one I like the best, uh, liquid crystals. Liquid crystals are uh, fixed, but you change with voltages, you either change the retardance or you change the orientation. If you change the retardance, they are called pneumatic. If you change the orientation, they are called ferroelectric. Uh, this is the movie. Uh, it should show that, you know, maybe I'm not found. So, okay. Uh, but you need to know for that voltage which retardants. You need to have a calibration, right? And that can be an issue, but you know, you just calibrate carefully. Why do I like this? Because 
change in the math. You need two liquid crystals, uh, and you need a linear protractor. So that's uh, something before it was just one retarder, one linear polarizer. Here you need one linear polarizer and two liquid crystals with retardants uh, delta one or delta two. If you do the math, you see that this is what you measure. And you measure again Q, U, and V. And the first thing you do is to say, okay, what have, what, how can I make sure I modulate the same for Q, U, and V? You may take this amplitude, make it equal to this, or make it equal to this. You get two equations. You solve for the values of delta two or delta one. You get these combinations that will make this amplitude the same. And you have this, your modulation matrix is the same. By definition, you force it. This is the demodulation matrix, and you get the efficiencies, the best you can do, 0.577 for all four stops parameters. There are no zeros here. You're always measuring all the stop parameters, and you're only doing four measurements. So I think conceptually, this is the cleanest way of uh, doing polarimetry. VTF, Indicus is doing that. Is there only a single solution to? Oh, I think there's only one. Yeah, this one. These are, so meaning these are different voltages, right? So you have to go to your calibration and say, okay, for this uh, retardances that I showed, uh, these are in waves. The other ones were in degrees. You need to apply different voltages. But I think there are. Yeah, I think it's. I mean. There are no uh, more magic here. Other than multiples, you can add two bytes and things like that. But you know, these are the only solution. So that's why I like like it. Uh, it kind of allows you for actually for this i plus v and i minus v, which is what uh, i plus q and i minus q, i plus u and i minus u, which is what i this is doing. So these are the benefits that there are no zeros. Uh, they are. Uh, Always giving you the maximum efficiencies. Half who is using them? Well, solar orbiter was launched on Sunday, and it had liquid crystal doing exactly that. We don't know if they work yet because the doors haven't been opened. But BTF, Dickies will use this. We use liquid crystal with this for. Uh, and that's what you were talking that you could, you had a implemented right. this, but no one was brave enough <laughs> to try for using it. Uh, well, it works. Uh, but, uh, so this is the IMAX, uh, the monitor that I built that have that. This is V, the solar orbiter, and it's using that technique. Here you see that it did work beautiful for IMAX, and for all this, uh, no, IMAX wasn't the first. So hold on, and before you go to the next step, uh, what is the reason of using one versus another? I mean, in a sense, the four is faster, you would yeah. prefer to have that, but... No, I mean, really not. Uh, so it, I think a key aspect is this thing of not having zeros that can make the stores parameters not compatible on the sides, depending on how fast you go, right? If you are at the same time moving sure. very fast, then nothing is going to impact you and you can use either one or the other. So there's no spectral regime problems. Uh, so crystals or not or some wavelengths. You mean achromaticity? Nanometers. Mm -hmm. Achromaticity or something yeah, like that? Yeah, achromaticity is another issue. You don't get really the yeah. if you want to use them below this 400 or above 1.7. Yeah, I agree. There is, but there is no fundamental reason to like one more than the other. I think from a theoretical point of view, the liquid crystals are nicer. But when you build an instrument, don't get too theoretical because it's not a good idea. So go yeah, practical. Yeah, that's uh, much less stable than what they do. Okay. So you need more frequent calibration. That's why for a space like they tend to use rotating wavelengths because then you cannot access to frequent calibration. I think That's probably true. Yes. I, I think one other. So for a ground-based spectrograph, you have to that wave plate has to be rotating at about 100 hertz in order to avoid seeing. some seeing effects. Yeah. So because you're doing the demodulation without any image correction, yeah. so you need to go very fast with a slit spectrograph or in order to beat these the, the seeing effects. Whereas for things like ETF or IBIS or imaging things, you can do corrections on the yeah. images afterwards the, and avoid yeah, some of the seeing effects so you can go slower. Yeah. You don't need to run at 100 hertz so you can use a liquid crystal, oh, which is limited really, to absolutely. a few hertz yeah. or something. Yeah. 
and then so that's it depends on your post processing. So really nothing to do with the polarimetry. Whether you can do post processing processing of one type or the other, you want to go one way or another. So it's full of all kinds of trade-offs. Uh, and you know, I'm not even really going very fast. Look, so if we start pneumatics, I said and ferroelectrics. Ferroelectrics change orientation, pneumatics change uh, the retardant. Ferroelectrics are better for the ground because they can go really fast. If you're trying to beat the atmosphere, it changes with 100 hertz. So you want to have ferroelectric, which can really modulate much faster. Pneumatics don't modulate that fast because how they work, they modulate much slower. So for space where you don't need to move that fast, pneumatics are okay. Uh, ferroelectric would be okay too, but for the ground, there's a tendency to use ferroelectric. Uh, I think BTF is using pneumatics, actually. Yeah, no, that's it. Ferroelectric is. I'm not sure. I think it's a good idea. We are from Medolar. I know that. From yeah. Medolar, only until recently, were able to build. I think it was. It's probably for a entry. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yes, yes. I think it's for a Yeah. It would be a similar solution, uh, but not with not with retardances, but the orientation. But you get the same kind of type of thing. So here I have a slide saying that telescopes or telescopes are a pain. Uh, this. You have to have, have to calibrate the polarimetry, and you have to calibrate how they change your uh, stokes parameters on the sun. Um, this is something we've done. I, I like to say on the nineties. Why? Because we were waiting for Demis and Les to come. Both of them were supposed to be instrumental polarization free. Uh, Demis came, but at the end of the decade. Less never came. So in between, we learned to calibrate the instrument, the, the instrumental polarization of the Dan Solar Telescope, of the Swedish Star Wars. You have to go through again more Euler matrices, math, input the telescope, put linear polarizer on top, rotate them. Yeah. So the, the, the final modulation matrix is uh, is product of many yeah. different things. All of this. So then, um, is the influence of these matrices? Uh, not important so that you oh yeah yeah, you, yeah 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 you have to know that to some level of accuracy if you really want to get okay but then to your final polarimetry which is the absolute but then what was the point of, of focusing on the mirror uh, of the modulation metrics of the polarimetry then you the final one is the product of all these things and this is the one that has to have the maximum efficiency well, i don't know about that i don't know about that all of it has to change it with the, the, the observation yeah, this changes with, so there are things that are changing with time. So like, for example, this is the azimuth of the sun, so it's changing, the zenith angle of the sun, so it's changing over time. But I think it's, all, all, both of them have to be good. Uh, so it's not, so the, your polarity, your modulation, the modulation you do with the liquid crystals or with the rotating wave, has to be good, and your telescope has to be good. Yeah, but what, my, my, my but point is that the angles, one is more important than the other. No, I mean, I mean that the angles or the retardances have to be adapted for the whole for the whole matrix, not well, for the that matrix. Gets into you calculate the, right. the matrix ahead of time for every table angle for every instrument right. um, orientation. Yeah, you can optimize and then the, it doesn't change. The, the molar matrix just, is square, so it's it's invertible just analytically. So you would demodulate your signal and then you could apply the inverse of the molar matrix to get the solar values. Yes. Right. But the question that there are zeros or not in your right the so the matrix may not be true. You may it may look like zeros in your ideal case, but it may not be zeros on the sun from the light from the sun. After yes. it might not be zero from the light from the sun, right. but that means you have a very bad telescope in front of you now. That you need to calibrate, but you right. can calibrate and then it's right. Yeah, yes. the zeros. Uh, what I was saying, there are zeros when you measure Q is Q in front of the instrument, uh, which is not Q on the sun. Q on the sun is mixed with the mirror matrix of the telescope. So yes, you're right. Okay, well, but you don't control that, and it changes over time. Right. Or in other words, that the that the angles the, or re, the retardances can be the optimal ones can be changing with time, so that the final matrix, moderator matrix, has the right. maximum so efficiency. These one are the best for measuring the stokes parameters in front of the instrument, not in front of the size. That is correct. So you want to know these Mueller matrices. The telescope was so bad that this is the Mueller matrix of the Swedish Tower for a day. <laughs> Miller in the morning, and that's selling whatever term you like or you hate. Uh, early in the morning, later on the day, look what the Miller Magic Service is doing. That's how bad solar telescopes are today. 
have this back. Uh, it's been done for uh, Inode, which is fixed. Uh, nothing is changing there, so it's kind of simpler. Um, and I don't think I have time to speak about the well being, but I think we're getting close, and I really want to go to the next. This is why we need to do the plus two of minus two. I can explain it later to whoever is interested. Uh, it's for the scene in this cross talk. And, uh, but I really want to go into this because you wanted me to say something about absolute polarity and relative polarity. For Dickies, for Dickies, these are our Miller matrix. Um, this is N1 and N2. I mean, uh, so this part is fixed. Here we put a calibration of ticks. It also depends on whether there is calibration of ticks, right? Uh, because once everything is calibrated, then you, it, well, it depends on the accuracy of what you know. You can go back to uh, to the sun better or worse. So here you are always putting calibration of ticks and calibrating your own. This is what I'm trying to say. And you put it as soon as you can. For a four meter mirror, you don't want to put it, there's no way, practical way of putting it at the, at the entrance of the mirror. So with calibration of this, we calibrate all these terms in, in here. And these two are changing over time, but we have calibrated them. This is the one that remains not calibrated, um, but we have plans for calibrating this, and we've calibrated much worse telescopes, way worse, the ones that you just saw, if you've been calibrated. So this is, and these are fixed. These angles are fixed. They don't change over the day. It's actually very simple calibration. Uh, but the requirements for Dickies is sensitivity should be 10 to the minus 5, and accuracy 5, 10 to the minus 4. These are the numbers that we're putting in the requirements. If you get the Dickies requirements, these are the numbers. Uh, you can think of signal to noise is the inverse. It's 10 to the 5. You need to be able to reach 10 to the 5. And you need to be this accuracy for this. Now, one thing that I always like to emphasize, sensitivity is exposure time dependent. Whether you reach 10 to the minus 5 is because you are adding photons. This one is not, uh, but this one is. Uh, the sensitivity is exposure time dependent. I don't know if you want to uh, me to discuss this. This is how many photons you have on the detector. And uh, the signal to noise, when you are measuring photons, because of the quantum nature of measuring phot photons, uh, the number of photons always has as a variance the square root of the number of photons. I think you also know that. The signal to noise is the ratio between the number of photons and the square root of the number of photons with quantum efficiencies, detectors, and other things, and you get this number. Here you have the exposure time. So the more you expose, the longer you expose, the better your sensitivity, the better your signal to noise. So sensitivity is exposure time dependent. So how do you how can we reach 10 to the 5 signal to noise? Well, by exposing longer. Of course, the problem is practical. Uh, I mean, what can you do? What is this? The intensity of the sun. There's not much you can do. I mean, the sun will get brighter over you know, by billions of years. But not much. So this is the diameter of the telescope. If it is thickest, it's thickest. Uh, this is your pixel. And typically for your resolution, you don't want to change, you, you, you force the pixel size because of the resolution you want to. You don't want to uh, change this. There's your detector, buy a better one, you have a better one. There's your spectral resolution, which probably has also other implications. You don't want to broaden and lose the spectral resolution. Exposure time, well, it's post for longer and you increase your signal to you measure more photons. Uh, so that's one way to increase sensitivity, but sensitivity. Uh, and when you do polarimetry, you have to take into account efficiency. The efficiencies appear here because you are more. That's how we define originally by improving the maximizing the signal to noise. This is the number of this is n how many s you were doing for your modulation scheme. But so it changes a little bit, but it's the same idea. It's post for longer and you increase the sensitivity. Now absolute polarimetry. So why is this so complicated that people say, well, what is absolute polarimetry versus relative polarimetry? I like to show this because I think it really shows what the difference is between absolute and relative. The sensitivity is relative. You're measuring something. You don't know your background. You just want to measure if it's changing over time. But that's a relative measure, right? And it is this, for example. You hear what you have is very good uh, relative precision, but very low accuracy. The absolute part is bad. Why? Because you have a reference. When you do an absolute measurement, 
you have a ground truth, you have a reference, you know what you want to measure, that's what you need for doing something absolute, an absolute measurement, then you have a reference that you can try to measure and see how close you get. You don't care how close you get, you can end up here, you have very good sensitivity, you will always get the same kind of thing, but you are far off from what the truth is, but you might not care, because you want to only measure relative things, okay, so that's one possibility. This one is, of course, you have great, absolute uh, accuracy and relative precision is also great. Here is also pretty good in terms of absolute measurements. But sensitivity is not that good. Suppose for longer and you'll get there. Okay, but here, once you are doing this systematically, you'll probably uh, there's no way for exposing longer. You will only get this narrower and narrower and narrower, but you're not going to get closer here, but you might not care. Depending on what you are doing. So, how many questions about this, which is interesting? Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, just clarification question. So, what is what is red dot, uh, uh, red circle, and the black dot mean? There? The important thing is this guy. You want to hate this guy. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's no sun or magic here. Sorry. I thought it was heavy. So. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that's, so that's the target, it's a target, okay, it's a target. So, in, in some way, we could say that... You need a ground truth for absolute Yeah, quality. the ground truth is basically where we are with respect to zero. Well, to something that you have, okay. to yeah. something that you have, okay, here is this guy. Yeah, and the... That's and what the, is absolute. Exactly, and the high precision is just what's the scatter of our measurements. Yeah. So right. if we do another measurement, this is going to be very close to the previous one, or it's going to be yeah. something wild. And you can improve on that by exposing longer and longer. Or having you... bigger wave and bins, or binning, or whatever. Well, in the case of the sun, is this formula. Exposure time yeah. was one of the terms. The others also help. Yeah. Right? And you make this smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. But the question is, you want to have absolute polarimetry, then you need to know something that you need to measure and see how close or far you are. And that's <coughs> the last part of my talk. Yes. Do we just do much. any relative measurements today? Oh yeah, all of the measurements, example. most of the measurements that we do polarimetry are relative. Yeah, but you always compare it to the ground truth. You don't just... Who? Cool. Mm -hmm. Not me. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, and you compare it to we always do it, you say about the continuum. Yeah, it's close to zero, exactly. Yes. close to zero, and right? I've got all my points. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> so, right. The, so you have a ground truth, the right. continuum. The continuum, yeah. right. right? The continuum is the ground truth, and you measure here, you know, or look how far I am. <laughs> I bring it here. <laughs> yeah. Somehow. Yes. You have to be careful how you do it, but that's how. But, but then you are using a ground truth. Yes. Okay, I, the continuum. I wouldn't call the continuum the ground truth. No, let me. Let me we measure relative to the ground. Okay, let me get there. The continuous one. So, yeah, that's what people do. So, uh, oops. so the best people that are doing absolute polarimetry, I think, is the team at Pearson with the Gregory Coudet telescope. A telescope that has terrible instrumental polarity and it's changing over time, but they have it calibrated and they do the best absolute polarimetry. <laughs> How good? Well, uh, this is uh, what they do at Pearsall, and if they select one line over here, this is Q over I, that's what they measure. These changes are the relative part that you can improve by adding more and more, by longer exposure times, and that's what they did here. Going from here to here is just adding more photons. Uh, here they did it because they average this, but it's adding more photons, you get lower noise. You get better sensitivity by adding more over time. And here they went for, this is 10 to the minus four, so they have 10 to the minus four type of nodes. By adding more photons, they went to 10 to the minus five, actually 1.6 to the minus five, okay? That's what they did here, by adding more photons. The question is, okay, look at this guy, but continuing is 0.02, is 0.025, okay? Is there, is it a good, is good absolute measurement or not? That's the real question. So the continuum is the ground truth for polarimetry, the one we use when we want to refer to absolute polarimetry. Why? Because there is a ground truth that is well understood, which is here, which is the uh, continuous scattering by of photons by neutral hydrogen atoms and tons of scattering. These two processes are really well understood in the photosphere of the sun. So we know what the continuum should be polarized. It's not that it's zero. Most of the time it's zero, so it's a scattering. So at this center, it's never polarized, the continuum. 
But as you go outside of this center, it gets polarized. Uh, and depending on the wavelength, of course, scattering as always in the blue is worse. So for mu point one, uh, and you go to the blue, you get higher continuity. So don't force only the continuity, you don't do anything wrong. But you're in the, in, in, at the center, yeah, put it at zero. Uh, but you are not trying, but, but then you are tricking the system, right? Uh, I'll say how you make real absolute measurements. Uh, it's because you say, well, I know it's zero, so I'll move it to zero. But it wasn't at zero, so your system was not doing good absolute polarimetry. You have to force it, okay? So this is the reference for everybody that is doing absolute polarimetry, matching this. And it needs to be matched at different wavelengths and at different new values. Uh, why? Well, you know, the telescopes, when they point at different points of the sun, uh, uh, goes through different systems. So your calibration problem is going to change. Uh, if, you're, if you are at the center, you get all the solar light going through all the optics, but you are at the limb, you, maybe some parts of your telescope are not heated by solar light. And then the calibration of that guys are changing. Uh, so that's what happened in practice in real life. So you want to do different new values compared to this theory at different wavelengths. Uh, different wavelengths implies that you put different filters and you get different sensitivities and systematics. So you want to test for all of them. Uh, in particular, because the requirement for DPS, I think, is 5, 10 to the minus 4, not at a new value or at a, uh, or, or at a specific uh, wavelength. It's in general. So you need to do all news, all values, and they did it at Pearson, and they got an order of magnitude better, absolute polarimetry than what we are demanding for DIGIS. What we're demanding for DIGIS is one order of magnitude four. So with this telescope, and how do they know it's 0.5 to the minus 4? This is 10 to the minus 4, and this is now mu. Okay? So this is the limb, and this is this center. Uh, and this center it should be zero. They are not forcing the continuum to zero. They just leave the continuum, so I'll show you what they do, but they just demodulate and see what the continuum is. Well, here is within zero, here is, you know, this, this is the error. So it's 5.5, 5, 10 to the minus 4, that they have at Ingersoll with this Gregory Coutet telescope, with the changing instrumental polarization, uh, which is the physical just driver or the, uh, or the um, astrophysical driver for pushing for, for that. I think, I think it's only the Halle effect. I think it's only the Halle effect. I think if you don't care about Halle, forget it. You're not the polarimetry, you bring the continuum to zero yeah, at the center. One. Uh, or depending on your weather, are you new at the value of this? But this will affect in very strong lines or something like that in ultraviolet. Because otherwise, it well, there is this idea about what is the ground level for scattering for a strong zoom, really. Uh, they are probably that you are doing good absolute comparing with, with what the simulations tell you is probably this thing to know the absolute number thing, right? But I think it's only through the hand effect that this really becomes important. Just to explain they, how they got this 10 to the minus 5 sensitivity is they, they don't have any spatial resolution, right? They're integrating a very large area. Well, no. I mean, no. several large no. seconds. Uh, that's sensitivity. Yeah. yeah. Sensitivity. yeah. Sensitivity. Right. Not absolute. No, no. Right. Right. The sensitivity they get right. is because they get sensitivity like DGIS, but with no spatial resolution. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. So that's sensitivity. Not, no, yeah. So to make yeah. it clear why. Yeah. Oh, why did it teach us? Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. It's so, easy to make the, the, the right. speed you when you get into the number six. Right. right. So yeah. No, I mean, it's yes. Just, that's just what it's oh, that's a yeah. That, of course. Yeah. That's, 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 so yeah, you can do ten to the minus. Do it ten to the minus five. No spatial or temporal. Right. They right. right. have right. right. a smaller. This is from a presentation from the usual team that I can also pass and put it on give to you and you see. Did they explain how they get to absolute polarimetry? It's through great pain of calibrating everything. The polarization calibration is important. Is that uh, so they have to do polarization calibration of all of their optical system, of course. But what I'm saying is that, yeah, so we've done this for the result system, this one. I mean, did they essentially have the This one is MacMath. This one is MacMath, okay? It's even worse. It's the last telescope we want to use for polarimetry. But we need it to, okay? So, yeah, I mean, it's a pain, but we know how to do it. Um, you have to calibrate. That's what we were discussing about the matrix in front of your polarimetry. You need to know it to a good degree to make sure you're doing good polarimetry. Because we, what, is, what is the test for this, for example? That's what they need to do. They need to measure the S, whatever scheme they're using. Measure this, the, the, the signals, okay? The 
you have to take out the dark color. You have to flip the S. There's a lot here. Uh, actually, there's a lot. Uh, because you might avoid that, or you might, uh, and actually, how you derive your flat field. Are you going to have a flat field per modulation stage or not? Or is the flat field the same or not? You think about flat field only as the game correction for a pixel? You might think it's the same for all modulation states. In practice, it's just this. Because there are all kinds of things that are changing when you are modulating with your different stuff. So you need different flat <coughs> Anyway, you do flat field. Then you demodulate with your uh, Penrose, boom Penrose thing, right? Uh, you correct for telescope instrumental polarization. This other metric that is in front, you need to correct for it. And hopefully you know it to a sufficient degree of accuracy. For DIGIS, we have one portion, which is the one we calibrate. I think we can reach good accuracy there. And then we have M1 and M2 that we calibrate in different ways, but I think we can also reach whatever accuracy we need for uh, this for these requirements that are even an order of magnitude worse. That would appear so that. So do that. Uh, correct for instrument telescope instrument polarization. Don't, don't force the continuum at zero now. Just go out there and see where you are in the continuum. And do it at different weight, different mu, and do it for all the stokes parameters. The only one that gets polarized is Q. The only one through scattering at uh, different times, yes, because of systematics, right? So uh, well, like, now, yes, well, different times. Yeah. Yeah. Because of systematic, different time, different, yes, yes, go back. Uh, Q will get the continuum polarized through this theory. U doesn't get any polarization. V doesn't get any polarization. It should go to zero. Just look where it is, and now you know what your, what your absolute polarimetry is. Uh, and uh, these two should be zero. This should be whatever the theory gives <coughs> you. And by comparing this, you know what your absolute polarimetry is. So I don't think it's. That's for Q, <laughs> defining Q as tangent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, it's polarimetry. You, you always need to know what your reference system is. You better know what your reference system is, right? So that's 101 polarimetry. Which many times you don't. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Why? <laughs> I mean, right. So, because people use P, it's V, for which you don't care really where the X and Y axis is. But when you have linear polarization, you need to care can we put a a reference frame for IMAX data where we have Q and U. You go through all the papers, you see we are talking about the square root of Q squared plus U squared, so we didn't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's a pain. In polarimetry, yes, it's good to know what your reference system is. What's the problem? I mean, you always know what your XY is in your polarimeter, and you have to propagate this back to the sun. Put it on the solar surface. And that gets tricky. But actually, in one of the cases that I had here, it actually goes back to the sun, which is uh, this neural matrix here. That's, that's the entrance window of the Sudis Tower. These two are just bringing you back to the sun. This is the P angle uh, and the parallactic angle. Uh, with this, you actually project whatever reference system you have at the exit of the neural matrix to the Sun to the surface. Okay, so science <laughs> orientation polarimetry is a pain. That what many people don't like it. I was told by someone from Germany, yeah, I don't want to do polarimetry; too complicated. <laughs> when I started solar physics, uh, but I still I can be and I did polarimetry. So basically, that's how you do absolute polarimetry, and I can put it. I know I went really fast. Uh, uh, but I hope you most or less got the basic idea. But I mean, the bottom line is that for doing something absolute, you need a reference to measure and compare with. Uh, and when you do relative, you also need a reference, but it's within your system. You don't go outside to get a reference, right? So does this, this mean that you have to know the uh, elements of the modulation matrix? Yeah, you better know, well, than you can translate better than the accuracy you want. Uh, well, no, I didn't say that. Better, all of them, I and mean, there are so many. No, I don't think that translates into a statement for all the modulation matrix. I don't think it does, because some are, will be hit by a Stokes eye, uh, others will be hit by... So, okay, let's say on average. Or well, yeah, on some ways of doing but some, what, I, what we're discussing now is that some of these modulation matrices, well, okay. Can I 
that's what it is. So it you, definitely, I was going to ask you to. Because that, I think, will, will say something about it. Here, who really is a problem is a stop sign. <laughs> You're trying to do polarimetry. And this is at the few percent of even, well, 10 to the minus 4, right? That's why you need 10 to the minus 4 sensitivity. It's really only one photon is polarized out of 10,000. That's how bad it is. Uh, but you're mentioning the other 9,999 photons. Uh, so these ones are the problem. Uh, I'm using that. Uh, they're, they're the good thing, too, for some people, right? Some people mostly care about this stuff, and I don't care about it. Uh, so, okay, uh, you see here, because what we're trying to do here with the polar image is also get rid of the influence of the stop side, in particular, not the stop side, but the changing, varying stop side. Again, keep in mind we're doing temporal modulation, modulating in time. If something changes in time, you're going to think it's, polar, it's polarization. And if something changes in time, you're modulating in time, it's polarization, but maybe something different. And if a big guy like a stock's eye changes in time, that can produce this problem. So the solution came from Bruce Lant. Uh, it's this one. And it was applied for the first time at the advanced source point. So we've been doing this linear polarization. So you're only doing polarization in one direction. But he says, okay, let's do, we do polarization also in the orthogonal direction. Meaning here you're losing half of the photos, right? It's also a photon efficiency kind of thing because we only measure photons polarized in this direction, this direction, you forget about all of them. Uh, he said, okay, we're gonna have it here. Uh, yes, you have a polarizing in the speed. You measure that and that. This is a, a, an anisotropic material that I explained at the beginning that different refractive indices for different polarizations. So it, it, because of different refractive indices, they go in different routes. Well, it's more complicated than that, but anyway, so you get the Minus Q and plus Q, now spatially separated. And you put two detectors, okay? This is the equation that I was using for um, the rotating weight rate. But it's true for all of them. It's true for all the cases that I uh, presented to you. And you can do a general case with no specifics to a rotating weight rate, liquid crystals, or anything. So the plus B, which is this one, has these signs. But as soon as you do the, you put the orthogonal polarization here, some of the signs flip. So this flip, but not the one on the stop sign. The one on the stop sign doesn't flip. But here, it's flip, it's flip, and it's flip. And that's always the case with any, polar, any modulation scheme that you can come. This is very complicated, so I'm going to just do the case when you're doing I plus B and I minus B. Okay? I'm going to just do two different measurements in time. This, uh, one is I plus B, and the other one is I minus B. But here, at time T1, I'm doing in one beam, I plus B, and in the other beam, I minus B, because it flips, okay? Then I go to time T2. At time T2, I change something in my system, and now I'm measuring here I prime minus B prime. Prime because I acknowledge it. That is not the same I plus B. Something has changed on the sun or the scene. Typically, this is a scene. The atmosphere has changed. So you're not going to measure exactly. Your, your intensity on the sun hasn't changed. But you are actually, because of scene, you are not measuring the same stock side. You're measuring a stock side from somewhere else. So it's not exactly the same. But you flip the sign. You flip the sign here as well. Well, uh, yeah, this is a time two for S1. And you change it and you flip the sign. And for time two, for the other beam, is also the opposite to this one, okay? And it's prime. And you just say, okay, uh, I prime is I plus some error, and B prime is P plus some error, okay? You keep the sign. Now you have these four measurements. So what is what you've done? You have two detectors, and you measure twice. Uh, and in between, you've changed things, so you modulate in time. But you're also kind of modulating in space for orthogonal polarization. So in keeping, these are the equations that you just saw, the same ones. And the magic is because uh, this B is going to change its sign, but plus delta I has the same sign, okay? Uh, so do the following. Take S1 at T1, which is this one, and S1 at T2, this one, and add them. You get twice those, twice I, 
delta i, v minus v goes away, and you get the minus delta. Um, subtract uh, what you do over you add, you get i, you subtract, you get v. For v, you are doing the subtraction, and that's when you get two times v minus delta i plus delta v. What's the problem? It's this guy. It's this guy, right? So this is big. This is also big, but not as big as those i's, a perturbation on i. And this is a perturbation on v, you can really ignore it. This is v. Is impacted by the perturbation on i. That's bad. The other one that is hitting you. This one is relevant because it's a perturbation on v. It's a second order thing. In here, do the same kind of combination, but get i2 and v2. And you follow the thing, and you get uh, 2i. This one is actually the same signs on delta i, but now you get, in this case, doing the same subtraction minus, if you subtract this to minus 2v minus delta i and minus delta v. So now you see that by taking these two, here you have minus 2v and plus 2v, and this is the same. So yes, take this one minus this one. You're going to get the two v's and these two guys cancel each other. So you finally have a V that doesn't have a delta I term. So you finally were able to get rid of all the fluctuations. So what it means is that for the orthogonal polarization, the delta I had a sign here, and the delta I had a different sign here, and you were able to measure V in both, but delta I was the same. You subtract them, and it goes away. No delta I. But it worked. Well, single beam, look at this. All of this is a stop side chain in Q. All, everybody's impacted. I just show it for I plus B or I minus the B, but everybody's impacted. Look at all of this. And it's bad because a changing delta I looks like B, of course. But you are totally subtracting to I, which looks like B, so it's positive negative. Look at this. It's everywhere, they're everywhere. This is for one beam. Take the signal from the other beam, subtract them, and look up to B. So, meaning that the problem is always I. The problem is contamination of the stop sign. So, you're, you're going back to your question. Not all the errors on the same, on the modulation or demodulation matrix needs to be of the same rate, depending on whether they multiply I or not. Depending on who, who, where is I, who is the that guy here, always. Yes? I mean, the, the two measurements at time t1 should yes. be enough, right? The, problem is, it. the problem is those are, to make two measurements, you have the measurement of Stokes 1 at time t1 and it. So you mean these two? These two are enough, right? Would be enough, theoretically. Oh, I see what you're saying. The problem is that those are done with two different detectors and you can't calibrate your detectors. So you have a different thing here. Okay. Right, you can't calibrate your detector to... You're going to have the fan on, assuming, okay, I'm going to have a flat field here. Right. Uh, is my flat field the same for both things? Um, then it's a, it goes into an error in the flat field. An error in the flat field will get multiplied by, guess what, the tide. Mm -hmm. And we're back to the same problem. And the alignment so, of the two cameras. Right, and the alignment. Right. alignment. So there are, but, but then <coughs> by combining, by doing that at the same time, Temporal modulation and spatial modulation, you flip things, and you can actually only get something like what I said, where you don't you don't impact your polarimetry by errors in a slow side. Because next week on Tuesday we're going to do the exercise, we're going to calculate these uh, these modulation matrices. So I thought maybe in the context of what the I was not intending you to no, no. do anything. This is him. No, no, yeah, yeah, this is him. <laughs> This is only, but maybe you could give us the, uh, some example of Mueller matrices of the remainders of the of the optical system, just so that we could check for this, to see how uh, to see like how how well we need to know it in order to, because the absolute precision basically only uh, depends on how well you know the Mueller matrix of your telescope. The last uh, the the, the and, and demodulation itself. matrix and both the demodulation matrix. You have a requirement on your demodulation on the how would you know your demodulation matrix on the instrumental polarization of the both. But in practice, what is harder to get? Oh, the telescope is always a pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because for the for the demodulation matrix, you can put calibration of this right in front. Yeah. And you may, you know, a calibration that is accurate to not astronomical standards, but optical standards, which are much better. Yeah. yeah. 
And the question was, very often we, we get some data, especially from the ground-based telescopes, and somebody tells us, be careful to check whether there is a crosstalk. Not because you're going to ask. Or something. Me. Oh, okay, okay. And the next time I'll ask you, so can you explain us where does that come from? Like when we look at slope Q and it looks like slope V. When, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's because you have a problem with crosstalk. <laughs> so you are saying if a Stokes Q looks like Stokes V, a Stokes v most likely, so the a Stokes I is the worst. Next one is V in terms of length. Uh, Zeeman signals are huge uh, in V, they are tiny in Q and U. So any crosstalk from V to Q and U is the one that we call C. Why? You haven't been told Q to B, it's because they don't see it, but it's there. It's also there. And typically, all of the matrices, they have symmetries. Uh, okay. That uh, tell you they are of the same order of magnitude. It's just the intrinsic signals of Q and U that are smaller. So, for example, I don't know about this. This was so bad that, but 0 0.6, well, yeah, change sign, 0 0.6. Uh, there are uh, symmetries here, 0.4. So you just flip it. Uh, meaning that if there is a V to Q, the Q to V is the same. <laughs> Almost. Maybe with a different sign. But yeah, but the same question one. was where, where does it come from? Does it come from the fact that we don't because know, don't know the main of the telescope? Because you don't know okay. 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 okay, that's always the case. But then people are questioning or uh, telling you, well, look, V is going to Q and U only because they see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because, no, 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 sure. You and you are going to V as well. Yeah. So, what is what I like to do? Uh, I go to a penumbra. Why? Because in a penumbra, everyone is big. Right? Q, U, and V are all big. So, you try to find signs of crosstalks also going in mm -hmm. the other direction to make sure. But yes, after spending many years working on this, if you give me some data, I'll tell you how much residual crosstalk has not been corrected <coughs> properly in the Seaman case. Now we're entering into the scattering uh, world, and the scattering is actually Q and U that are bigger. Mm -hmm. So for degrees, we will have different effects. Uh, we will have huge uh, linear polarization signals impacting our field measure. And this will be true in the coronal case, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, they have different symmetries. There are always ways of doing a detail to some extent. Just, I mean, of course. The thing is, this 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 6. Um, you really need to get there. Then, but it's just so uh, I guess the, the, the good thing we did in the 90s is to calibrate solar telescope. So we know how to do it. And even with that map, we can do it. Uh, it's a pain, it's the factor that uh, has residual cost up. But we can always do a good job there. But that this residual cost of is uh, precisely the accuracy. Yeah. The, I mean, how you know yeah, the yeah, matrix? Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. at this level that you um, target for the kist, uh, you will probably barely see crosstalk. But what I'm saying is that no. five ten to the minus four is trivial. Is what I'm saying. Five ten to the minus four is a trivial, absolute accuracy. Irsol with a much worse telescope is doing a far I mean, for, for, for the kist. They have smaller telescopes. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not a question of size, it's a question of how much you are. But this is a kind of thing. So, this is the amplitude of the Because you don't know. So, which one? This one you mean? The accuracy, yes. Well, I don't know where this number is coming from. Anyone here that has been more related with this, do you know where it's coming from? What I'm saying is that with a way worse telescope. Just, uh, <laughs> what I mean is that this say, 5, 10 to the minus 4 is the expected crosstalk, residual crosstalk you will see in your, uh, in your signals. Probably so that yeah. was put yeah. in the your yeah, yeah. Probably that was put. Probably that would have made sense. <laughs> what I'm saying is that it's really not that demanding. This 5, 10 to the minus 4, I would say. Yeah, well, in some telescopes we are pushing for sensitivities at, uh, at this order. But that's exposure time. Yeah. yeah, right. So it's a number of photons. Uh, well, this is almost 10 to the minus 3, okay, which is what we get all the 
I mean, this is only a factor of two, apart from 10 to the minus three. <laughs> yeah, but this is what, yeah. 10 to the minus three is whatever you're getting. Uh, it's what you get from the telescopes. So, so I, I like to, I don't know how much science you used. Uh, I don't know how much time people like, online have, but people who are I mean, here say and listen to you as, uh, as, as much as they want. Yeah. Uh, do we, but, but wait, let's ask. Do we have any questions from our listeners online? <laughs> if you, yeah, if you are still there. It's really too geeky, this conversation. Yes. <laughs> but that's the way it's supposed to be. So, you've seen this, uh, yes, uh, many times for me, uh, but I'll show it again. That's related to what you were saying, I think. Um, so, signal to noise 10 to the 4, right? You want to measure one polarized photon out of 10,000. You want to have 0.1 arc second resolution. And you want to have exposure times of 10 seconds. That's very demanding. Solar physics is not here. Yes, we do 10 to the 5. I just showed you one example. But then it's not with 0.1 arc second. It's with one arc minute and with hours. Okay, and then just yes, give it to 10 to the 5. Uh, Typically, what is solar physics today? Actually, in point one second, this is IMAX, and probably I think uh, Big Bear gets there, and whoever gets there in point one second and 10 seconds. It's really good, but it can only get 10 to the 3. You don't get, it's really hard for them to go with it. Well, it's actually impossible. And uh, no, they kind of reach this parameter space. Because if you want to reach this parameter space, you go to the same equation I was using for single to one, just throw there this number. And solve for the diameter of the telescope and get four meters. So you want to be here, four meters. Because this is the intensity of the sun. The sun is a bright as it is. The quantum of is what they are. Uh, the spectral resolution is not much we can change. Uh, and well, these two are determined by these two, so, so there's not much room to play. So you want to get here. And that's what we're trying to do. This, this is what we think is, is going to be. Which is not diffraction limit. Because if you put diffraction limit, then what you're saying is this guy. And it's not lambda over D. And it's not using a filter up or a spectrograph. No, if this is using whatever. whatever. I don't this is using whatever. Point. This is because <laughs> whatever uh, you put it here, this is using whatever. Yeah. Right. You have to the spectral resolution goes here. The spectral yeah. resolution goes here. You put the number single pixel. Yeah, I know, but that, that well no, I can't show the spectral resolution view. Because you need to scan it at the line or the field of view. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. That is for a single <laughs> scanning point. Yes. 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 yes, 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 of course. Um, right. It is. Uh, it is for that guy. That piece. Yes. Okay, you uh, that, then you go to 50. <coughs> so, what happens at the diffraction limit is that this guy is lambda over D, right? That's what the diffraction limit is. You force this guy to be lambda over D. You put here lambda squared over D squared. D squared, root squared, goes D, D and D cancel, and you have no relation whatsoever with the size of the telescope. The fraction of it doesn't matter what, how big your telescope is. You, all you can do is make the sun brighter <laughs> or something. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. You, you get better diffraction. So if you increase the There's only one diffraction limit, limit. lambda over D. Uh, yeah, but, but, but this increases with the, uh, so this increases yes. with the, uh, yes, the right. right. So you, you get better land over D. Yeah. But is there some similar to know it? No, no, no. Oh. Yeah. Uh, this is a more personal question, but very often people propose to do spectro, spectroscopic observation and something like that and not do polarimetry. And then very often you hear remarks that it's a pity not to do polarimetry because you can always just add things and get the stock side. No, it's a price to pay for polarimetry. It's a time. Yeah, it's a time. You measure four things, right? So it's a price to pay for polarimetry. Uh, sure. But so you I really need to make sure that your the polarimetry is going to give you something you want to measure. I mean, if you don't care about what polarimetry gives you, what is what polarimetry gives you? It gives you a lot of things. Don't think it's just a magnetic field. Because sometimes you will be more sensitive to temperatures <coughs> somewhere because you have polar uh, or to velocity. Intensity itself is also sensitive to polarimetry. That's sometimes forgotten. Intensity, you have this limit splitting, right? You have the So it's also sensitive to magnetic fields. 
uh, but it depends on what you want to do, but it's a price to pay for quality. Oh, yeah. No, sure, but I mean, when I do modulation, I'm measuring I in each of my modulation states. So instead of having uh, exposure time of 60 milliseconds, I, I'm now just mm -hmm. guessing the numbers, I can just have uh, six times 10 milliseconds, right? And I'm going to measure the same eye in the same in these two situations. If your sign requires to go fast 10 milliseconds because the cadence is important and things are changing at 10 milliseconds, you better do that. Of course, no, of course. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's a price for paying for a I don't know if that's what you were trying to ask. But not, not for, for uh, intensity. For intensity, you can even randomly modulate and you always get intensity. Right. You are probably wasting in, in noise from the sensor because you're probably taking more frames than you yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. but right. nowadays it's not really relevant. So because the detector read and noise is you really read more and then you add more. Yeah. 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 One yeah. interesting yeah. point is that the equation needs to change in the yeah. yeah. noise. You cannot really do precision spectroscopy without knowing what is going on with polarization in your telescope because of cross yeah. mm -hmm. So you, even if you don't want to measure polarization, you need to know uh, what is going on. You should have to either so way. And then the eye you are measuring is not really the eye you are you want to measure. Okay. So only okay. you need to know what is going on. Okay, that makes uh, sense. Yeah. Otherwise, if you are only measuring eye, you can have crosstalk from other parameters to buy or so it can change. The intensity changes. Well, you're measuring the sum of you're just integrating the Stokes vector, right? Yeah, no, I, what I mean is I, I, I just want to. I'm only interested in the Stokes eye, right? Uh, but I don't know what the polarization the telescope is doing with the light. I would have measured the wrong eye. So, are you are you in focus? If I, if I want to do absolute photometry, so yeah, yeah, that's my point. Yeah, like, what, what you're trying to say is that uh, what, what you're saying is that if I want to know intensity down to 10 minus 4 limit, and my Q is, for example, 10 minus 2, and my crosstalk from Q to I is 10 minus 2. Then I then I don't know the intensity and then to the minus four limit because I'm not measuring Q and I can't remove this spurious yeah. intensity in this case. You're doing absolute photometry, but it's all the intensity you're measuring is it's just some everything of, right? of all four Stokes components. And it's all like intensity you measure. Intensity you measure is a linear combination of yeah, yeah. Stokes parameters. Yeah, it's only modulation. We are talking about the effects of the telescope. And I mean, right? respect to the source. What do you know? Right back to the source. We can read this. Let's let's. No, yeah, so yeah. I'm measuring when I measure. I measure i plus q plus i minus q. I'm yeah, but this, in this modulation, but in the telescope, you have you have this right. You have what, what you measure is your telescope Mueller matrix times the original. So if this is polarized and this is something, then you're going to get some i, which is going to have contribution from the solar q, u, and v. So you're going to get wrong intensity. Is that what you were saying? Oh, so the Mueller matrix can yeah. destroy it. Especially if yeah. it's really wrong. Yeah. 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 And I think yeah. that's the sense. I mean, the problem for highly polarized astronomical sources, or which is never too polarized, or very accurate photon. Or very accurate photon. Yeah. Yeah. So they did the demodulation matrix wouldn't add up to one. You're saying you'd have demodulation. No, 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 no. The, the adding to one is something that is from optics. It has nothing to do with astronomy. So they always add to one. What, what he's saying is that you are not, uh, well, you don't know, you're not even doing the modulation in matrix. You are just doing intensity. You don't right. do polarimetry, but you are doing polarimetry because you have a telescope in front of it. Exactly. And you don't know that. So you don't even try to correct for the, the demodulation. You have a telescope in front of you. The telescopes will always, so where, 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 if you Where is the only one that is very intense? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something important. Casting and focus. Uh, two mirrors. So, you know, even in a prime focus, you have a change in D and you sign uh, because it's a reflection of a mirror. Casting uh, and focus has the identity. But actually, only at the center of the pixel. Because if you go with your image, outside of the center of the image, you are already off axis. <laughs> and if you are at the 10 to the minus 5, within your image, the calibration changes within your image at the 10 to the minus 5 level. So it's not true. So who is on axis? Who is the center of pixel? Only that guy, OK, at 10 to the minus 5. 10 to the minus 5, only one pixel is, is on axis. Everyone else is on axis. 
My definition. My head hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's finish the. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks to the people online for listening. Let's let's finish the meeting.